Good morning on this uh, cool June morning. I have one announcement this morning. Uh, next Sunday, I'm going to do virtual communion. And so what I would like you to do is to cube yourself a piece of bread and get yourself a little, uh, a little glass of uh, grape juice. And then I will lead us in our communion service uh, next week so we all can partake in communion. Let us start with our opening prayer. Merciful and just God, we gather here this morning, each of us with many concerns on our hearts. Our hearts are concerned with systems of injustice which strip people of their dignity and their very lives. Help us to be those who would seek peace with justice, who would fight for those who are oppressed, offer voices for the voiceless, and dignity for all humankind. Be with us this day and guide our steps toward a more just world. In your name, amen. Would you please join me in our call to worship? Welcome this day to a celebration of God's magnificent creation. Thanks be to God the Creator, who has loaned to us such a beautiful planet. Welcome this day to a recognition of God's redeeming love. Thanks to God the Redeemer, who has given us God's only Son as our example and teacher, our Savior and Redeemer. Welcome this day to the joy of God's Holy Spirit of truth and power. Thanks to God, the sustainer, who walks with us every day, guiding and guarding our steps. Amen. And now Donna will lead us in our children's story. Hi, kids. I'm glad to know that you're out there this week, even though I can't see you. Um, before we have our story, I just wanted to mention that if we were all in church here together, today would have been Children's Day in the church. And it was a special day that we all enjoyed, um, the grown-ups and the kids too. And it was a day when we got to celebrate the children. So we can't do a Children's Day the way we usually do because we have no children here. But we have done something a little bit special that I wanted everybody to know about. You kids already know. Um, but this week, we, um, some of our Sunday school teachers delivered special gifts to the children who came to Sunday school this year. And it's our way of letting you guys know that we love you and we miss you and we can't wait until you're back in church with us. And when you are, get ready for some really big hugs because we've all been missing you guys. And so Pastor Doug and I are going to try to put some pictures of you guys with your gifts into this service. I'm hoping it works. So if the next thing you see are pictures of the kids, then it worked. <laughs> if you don't see the pictures of the kids, then we will attach them as files in the email that we send out. Um, but I'm hoping that I've learned enough about editing videos that you're going to be able to see the pictures. Um, so I want to thank the ladies who delivered the gifts, and I want to thank the parents and the grandparents who brought the kids to church all year. And I hope you have a great summer, and we're really looking forward to getting everybody back in this church so we can all be together again. So with that out of the way, today's story is about a woman named Esther. Now this story takes place way before Jesus was born. And all of the stories we've had so far have been way before Jesus. So Esther was a very beautiful woman. And the king had picked Esther to be his new queen. And that was a really big deal for Esther. 
Now, Esther was someone who worshipped God. Not everybody in that country did, but there were people who loved God and worshipped God. And Esther had a cousin named Mordecai, who also was one of God's people. The king did not know that Esther was one of God's people. So there were some people in the palace, and this story is going to sound a little bit familiar. It sounds a little bit like what happened to Daniel. There were some people in the palace who were worried about God's people because there were lots of people who loved God. And these folks got scared that God's people might try to take over. So this one man who was one of the king's helpers, name was Haman, he came up with a plan and he was going to try to kick, trick the king into killing all of God's people. Now this kind of sounds like what they planned about Daniel when they threw him in with the lions, remember? They were trying to get rid of him because he loved God. Well, they made a rule that everybody had to worship Haman. And Mordecai said, no, I'm not doing that. So then they came up with a plan. Okay, this is how we can get rid of these people. Well, Mordecai went to his cousin Esther and he told her what was going on. And he said, they're going to kill all of us. And she said, well, what can I do? And he said, you need to talk to the king. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but it was a really big deal back then. Because first of all, Esther was a woman, and people didn't listen to women back then. And secondly, nobody talked to the king unless the king invited them to come and talk to him. And if you tried to go talk to the king without an invitation, you could be killed. So Esther had a big decision to make. And she decided that she would trust God and she would go talk to the king, even without an invitation. So she did. She went to the king. She knocked on his door. He let her in. Nobody came and dragged her away. And she told him what was going on. And she said, I'm one of God's people. Now the king loved Esther, and he was really angry at the plan that Haman had come up with. So he made sure that God's people were safe. So Esther was kind of a hero, wasn't she? Remember we've been talking about heroes? Because she did something really, really dangerous. She took a chance. Uh, and went and talked to that king without permission. And it could have gone very badly for Esther, but she trusted God, just like Daniel trusted God when he was in that lion's den. And God took care of Esther, and he took care of his people. And so sometimes it's scary to stand up and t tell people when you think something is wrong, and it could be kind of scary for you to do that because you don't know what they're going to do or say. But I think Esther's story and Daniel's story helps us to remember that if we trust God, he will help us have the courage to do the things that we know are right. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Our first scripture reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit in teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. Today we hear the final verses of Matthew's Gospel. In these verses, Jesus tells his disciples to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now we usually refer to these last final verses in Matthew's Gospel as the Great Commission. We need to keep in mind that this is the first time the eleven disciples in Matthew's Gospel, at least the way the story is told, have seen Jesus in Galilee. It's the first time they've seen him since his death. And Matthew comments on something that I think we often overlook. That when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Think about that. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, standing right before these disciples. The ones who had spent three years walking with Jesus and we're told some of them doubted. I think one of the reasons Matthew comments on this doubt is because of the job that Jesus gives the disciples to do. And they must have thought when they heard what Jesus was asking them to do. How can we possibly do this? They probably doubted they could do it. And what were the tasks that Jesus was asking these disciples to do? First was to make disciples of all nations. Second, they were to baptize the people of those nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And third was to teach them everything he had commanded them to obey during the time that he walked on this earth with these disciples. Keep in mind that these disciples did not have any special training to accomplish any of those tasks. Jesus did not leave them a playbook. The Gospels, by the way, had not yet been written. The Apostle Paul, whose letters make up most of the New Testament, had yet to be converted. The church had not even been formed. The doctrines that we have had not even been formed. Jesus was given these 11 original disciples what must to them sounded like an impossible task. What teaching aids they did have that they could pull from consisted of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, and the disciples' memories of what Jesus had said and done while he was with them. No wonder some of them were told, doubted. But these 11, by the way, did go out and do what Jesus commanded. And if they hadn't done so, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to you about these 11 disciples in Jesus this morning. 
These days, so many of us tend to be reluctant or perhaps skittish about doing what Jesus asked those first disciples to do, going out, out of this church building and making disciples and teaching. I think probably one of the reasons or a lot of the reasons that we're reluctant is because of the culture that we actually live in today. We think of evangelism in the same vein, maybe as a door to door salesperson. I think most of us can probably recall sometime in our life that somebody came knocking on our door and was going to try to sell us something. And maybe that experience did not go well. We were not comfortable with the person trying to sell us something. I, I call that kind of selling, by the way, it is a hard sell that people want to sell something and they don't want to have you say no, so they stay at your door for a while trying to get you to buy something. But you know something, when you look at the Gospels, Jesus doesn't ask us, any of us, to do any cold calling or to hard sell anyone. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe the things that I commanded you. So in other words, if we had this morning 40 people in church, there would be 40 different ways to do what Jesus asked us to do. We don't each have to do all these things, but it's important that each of us do our part. I read an article this past week about rural churches. And when I tell you the rural churches, I mean, I know the population of Williamstown is about 32 or 3,300 people. These churches were in populations of 500, 1,000 people. But these churches found out that all their growth came when a member of a church went out and talked to a family member about their church or their friends. And then that person came and tried the church, and some of them probably stayed, and maybe some of them didn't stay. But the ones that did stay, then they went out, and they talked to their families, and their friends, and their contacts, and pretty soon, the church began to grow. Now, all these churches that I read about had an annual, uh, they had an attendance of between 40 and 60 members. Most of these churches, by the way, started out with less than 20 members. Now, when I thought about those rural churches, they were doing exactly what Jesus had asked his first disciples, to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So how can we, how can we feel like we can do this? Because we don't, we don't want to doubt, like maybe some of those original dis, uh, disciples did, although in the end, none of them doubted. What is it that Jesus commands us to teach others? When asked which was the greatest commandment, Jesus said, you shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second likewise is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is known as the great commandment. Jesus gave us a great commission to teach others the great commandment. And to do that, we have to first live it in our own lives. You know the old saying, actions speak louder than words. You know, when I think about this scripture reading, if there is ever a time in our country when we need to hear about loving God and loving our neighbor, it is now. Jesus made it clear that he issued the commandment, these two great commandments he issued together. They go together. You cannot love God if you do not love 
your neighbor. We, we need as Christians to lead by example. You know, after observing this week the killing of Mr. Floyd on my TV screen and the disregard and mistreatment of our brothers and sisters who are peacefully protesting. And yes, I know there is a small element that mingles in with these peaceful protesters and want to cause a lot of harm and a lot of trouble for the peaceful protesters. But it feels like our leadership has forgotten the part about you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We seem to have forgotten that when you open your Bible, you will in fact find this command. We seem to have forgotten that our neighbor is in fact all the people who live in this world that God created for each one of us. Not for some of us, but for every one of us. Do you know what evangelism really is, if I could put it in its simplest form? It's the giving of blessings to your neighbor, showing them the love and justice that Jesus speaks about in the Gospels. The same blessings and justice, by the way, that you would seek out for yourself. You know something? God did not put us in this world by ourselves. He put us in this world with a diverse community of people. This diversity seems to be a problem for so many in this world. But when you read about Jesus, it surely was not a problem for him. He declared the greatest commandment was to love God with everything that you have. And then to love and treat your neighbor in the same way you love God with everything you have. And by the way, he did not say our neighbor was the person that's living across the street from us. Our neighbor is everybody who lives in this big world that he created for us. By the way, we are all his creation. We, as Jesus' disciples, those who follow his teachings, his commandments, need to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And to drill that down is that great commandment, those two great commandments, to love God with everything you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. I don't think we can really follow Jesus if we ignore those great commandments. Just imagine when you look out at this world, especially in the last week, how we could heal the world, world if we all lived by Jesus' teachings, if we loved and respected our neighbors. Let us, as his followers, be people who pass on our love and our blessings to our neighbors. I believe that Jesus commands nothing less. Amen. I have a few joys and uh, concerns this morning. First of all, uh, it's a joy. I have a birthday to announce and would like to wish Nancy, Nancy Avery, a happy birthday. My wife tells me I should not sing because I can't sing, but Nancy, happy birthday to you. Uh, I would just like to also thank the kids for all the hard work you did this past uh, year in the church uh, in Sunday school. I know we got 
cut a little bit short because of the pandemic. But I'm like Donna, I can't wait to I see you in church again uh, next fall. And I'll be looking forward to uh, giving you also a big hug. And I just want to, uh, I think we, uh, after seeing the TV screens this past week, we need to pray for peace in our country uh, between people. Uh, pray for our leadership. Um, and also, while this has all been going on, I know a lot of people are forgetting about the pandemic, but the pandemic continues to go on. Uh, the last time I checked, I think there were 110,000 people now that have died from the coronavirus. Uh, and I know in a lot of states, uh, the cases are way up, and that is a concern. So we need to be praying uh, for uh, our brothers and sisters in the country that are fighting this, uh, this pandemic. So let us be in prayer. God of love and mercy, you have given us stewardship to care for this wonderful planet. And yes, to care for our neighbors. We have, each one of us, been blessed with a variety of gifts and talents. And you call us to use them to help others. Those others are our neighbors. Open our hearts today to ministries of peace and justice. Embolden us to become part of this great cloud of witnesses who were unafraid to be your disciples. We think of so many in this church and in our lives who have gone before us braving the difficulties presented by life. We name them in our hearts before you, grateful for their example. We also name in our hearts those people who are ill, who mourn, who feel lost and alone, those who are part of cultures of oppression and indignity. Help us to be those people who, by our example, will break those chains of poverty and bullet burst the doors that imprison their, imprison their spirits. Be with this church that it may be a true witness to Jesus Christ in all that we do. And now let us take a moment and bring our silent prayers to you this morning. And now let us say together the prayer that our Lord and Savior taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Standing on the Promises.
forth with ministries of peace and justice and be good stewards of the earth and its people that God has and be people as God has called you to be. And please take time to love your neighbor. Amen.